morning, Ted's community. It is good to be with you again, and I just want to express my gratitude for this opportunity. It's been great to connect to your community. I've enjoyed the conversations uh, as, a, as a covenanter, I guess, coming in as an outsider. But, man, I'm a brother. I'm a brother in Christ, and I'm grateful to, uh, to share God's word with you and to share some story. Um, so I am so grateful. So I just want to start by, we say koyana. That's how we say thank you in our language. So koyana, koyana buk. Thank you very much. Uh, that's, that's how we say that. So, um, so thank you very much. Um, just, I, I want to show a few slides here, if we could. Um, I, was, I was out at um, the Crazy Horse Memorial on our way back from Chicago in 2008 with our family. We were driving from Chicago back to Alaska. We went to Yellowstone. From there, I took the rest of the way while my family flew home. But while I was at the Crazy Horse Memorial, we made sure to visit Mount Rushmore, you know, so we went to Mount Rushmore. But then I said, kids, we're going to Crazy Horse. And it's a, it's a, a monument that's still under construction. Not a penny of U.S. government money has been used to build that monument that's under construction. Um, but we went there and I saw this shirt. They had this right here. Fighting terrorism since 1492, Homeland Security. And, okay, as a native... Um, indigenous person. It's kind of funny. Um, and so one of the, one of the people on the, the far right is uh, Geronimo. Um, and then there's this one. So this is from a few years ago. So there's the pilgrims showing up, and there's the Indians. Um, looks like they're building a wall. They say they're building a wall, says the guy in the boat. They say they're building a wall because too many of us enter illegally and won't learn their language or assimilate into their culture. <laughs> So, of course, that was commentary on, on immigration things in our country. But, um, but as an indigenous person, you know, I thought, oh, that's, that's a good one. <laughs> and, and, and it's interesting that in the conversation of immigration, the Native American voice hasn't necessarily been drawn upon all that much. But anyway, I, I wanted to just kind of start with a little bit of Native humor, if you will. Um, you, you should know that, that we Natives have uh, four BCs, Right? There's before Christ, uh, but we also have before Columbus, okay? That's two. Uh, the third one is before Custer, so we got before Custer. And then the last one, uh, if, I don't know if you've seen the movie, but um, Dances with Wolves, before Costner. So <laughs> we've, got, we've, got, we've got the BCs going on. But, uh, well, today in, our, in my last time with you, um, I want to talk about... Uh, reconciliation, um, this journey, it's a journey that requires tears. And I think I titled it a, a hope, a vision for hope on a trail of tears, something like that. But, but it requires tears. And tears is something that we're not real comfortable with in our society, I think. When you go to funerals or whatever, I, I can't count how many times I've heard someone say when someone has died, um, be strong, don't cry, you know. And it's just, it's just uncomfortable when people people start crying, right? So um, I just want to warn you, I might cry when I'm talking today, uh, so just, I hope you'll just take it in and uh, not feel real uncomfortable, but because, uh, because there's pain. There's pain uh, when there's brokenness in relationships. There's pain when there's, there's deep pain, when it's relationships between peoples. I was talking to a friend of mine in Anchorage who does reconciliation work throughout our state. He works with the courts, native people groups, churches, ministries, and, and we're, I said, yeah, I'm going to Chicago. What are you doing? I'm going to talk, and the theme is reconciliation, the church and reconciliation. And I, I, I wanted to pick his brain, and he said, oh, man, you know, we're just, we started talking about uh, native people group relations, and, and he, he said he's done his work in Kosovo and Africa and Alaska and all around the world. And he said, you know, pretty much the history of people is we just don't treat each other very well, you know. So it's just a reality that, that we deal with in, in brokenness. But, um, but for us to be on this journey of reconciliation, uh, what I want to say to begin with is that uh, to, to lament, um, I, I think we need to become neighbors and not just neighbors, but neighbors who love one another. Um, neighbors who are willing 
to enter into the stories of brokenness, of people groups, entering the stories of marriages that are on the rocks, you know, whatever. We need to be willing to enter into those stories and, and be present and not try to come with solutions and band-aids and pills that can solve the, the brokenness. Uh, because really, uh, as we talked about on Tuesday, it's, we, we can't. We can't. We can't. This is not something that we can accomplish, reconciliation. Rather, it's a gift from Jesus. Amen? It's a gift. Um, and I, I, I just could not think of, I, this story just kept coming to my mind. Because in the story, the parable of the Good Samaritan, there's an expert who wants to get out of the, uh, he wants to remain convenient with who he thinks his neighbor is, right? And this story breaks down and, and challenges us um, that we can't just be comfortable with who we say our neighbor is. The categories we use, whether it's race or same people in our socioeconomic class or gender or same, you know, professional football team allegiances, right? <laughs> Whatever, you know, we, we can't just remain in that place of being comfortable. We have to be willing to enter into people's stories and maybe in places that are rather uncomfortable because we may have something to do with that, right? With the brokenness. And I, I got on a couple, last week, uh, my Facebook popped up. There was, we have an organization called First Alaskans Institute. Their, their motto is progress for the next 10,000 years. Kind of cool, I like that. Um, we're a people group that's been around for millennia. Um, progress for the next, anyway, so, uh, my cousin posted on her Facebook page and it popped up on mine. Um, and it was, it was these remarks from our first lady, Michelle Obama, on April 8th, speaking at a, um, at, uh, a convening on cr creating opportunity for native youth. She said this, folks in Indian country, and her and the president went to North Dakota some time ago on a reservation. Folks in Indian country didn't just wake up one day with addiction problems. Poverty and violence didn't just randomly happen to this community. These issues are the result of a long history of systemic discrimination and abuse. Let me offer just a few examples from our past, starting with how back in 1830, we passed a law removing Native Americans from their homes and forcibly relocating them to barren lands out west. The Trail of Tears was part of this process. Then we began separating children from their families and sending them to boarding schools designed to strip them of all traces of their culture, language, and history. And then our government started issuing what, we, what were known as civilization regulations, regulations that outlawed Indian religions, ceremonies, and practices. So we literally made their culture illegal. That was our first lady saying those words. And my cousin on Facebook, man, it's so good to hear someone other than a native say that, much less our first lady, you know? In a moment, I, for a moment, I, in that moment, I thought, you know, there's someone who's, who's making a stride to be a neighbor with the Native American community. And, you know, uh, I want to be careful because I'm going to share some things here that, of, of more history of, of pain, but it's not about like, you know, well, man, we had it worse than you guys, you know. I mean, we, they really messed up, and your story's not as bad, you know. It's not about competitive, you know, that, that we have the worst story, so you should feel sympathy for us, and, you know, it's not about that. Um, but it's about what, what I feel like is a story that you just don't hear too much about, you know. You don't hear too much Native American story. Indigenous people's story is just not part of our mainstream narrative. I can't tell you how many times I've been in church or gatherings, you know, like this, and I hear speakers say, talk about um, our different minority groups in our country, um, African Americans, Latino Americans, and Asian Americans. And I'm sitting there. And that's where they stop, you know. That's made me mad. That's made me struggle with feeling like um, my people are invisible, you know. And, and by and large, I, I was on a jet ride to, from Anchorage to Kotzebue, with, and I sat by this woman who works for um, one of our native corporations in Alaska. And I said, so, Andy, is it just me, or does it feel like the Native American voice is fairly invisible or, or silent? And she's like, well, yeah, 
Yeah, I think, I think so, you know. But for a moment, Michelle Obama was a neighbor, it felt like, you know. And, and, I, I, and it, it just did something. It just did something in me, and I felt, yeah, man, I'm glad. My cousin, my cousin, who's also native, said it's, it's good to hear somebody else. And so I think that for us as Jesus followers to be willing to take steps from far to near each other and each other's stories, stories of, stories of brokenness. I was reading um, a book by, um, I think he used to be at Duke, maybe now he's at Notre Dame, Father Emmanuel Katangole and Chris Rice, Reconciling All Things. And, and when I read it, there's some of the things they, they spoke about gripped me, and it's where I want to go now from, from being neighbor to, to lament, because lament is, is it's prayer. And for us to even begin to think that we would see reconciliation between neighbors, between enemies, between people groups, uh, if we're going to even begin to see there be, I'll say, progress, um, steps towards reconciliation, we have to start with prayer, right? And lament is just that. It's, it's prayer. Listen to what they said about it. To lament is to become gripped by the truth of the rupture and the high cost of seeking reconciliation. To learn to lament is to be broken. It's uncomfortable being broken. But to learn to lament is to be broken. To learn to lament is to see our own visions of transformation shattered on the rocks of the truth about the world's deep rupture and how we ourselves, you and me, are a part of the brokenness. But this word rupture, it, it, it did something in my mind and, and heart to see how lamenting helps us to, 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 to feel the rupture in the world and relationships. And here's where I thought it, what they, it just kicked. To the extent we do not experience a shattering, something we cannot, something new, the gospel of Jesus, reconciliation, the minute, something new cannot break in. The relationship between lament and hope is crucial. And they went on to say that reconciliation without lament cheapens hope. Reconciliation without lament cheapens hope. Now, I'm, you know, I have an office and I've got a staff person. I've got one administrative assistant and one day, uh, you know, I was kind of hemming and hawing about maybe leaving the office early and she said, well, Curtis, do you, do you need to leave early? You know, and I've got three kids at home. I travel lots and somehow I was working on boundaries and she said, do you, do you need to get home early? You know, your kids and and I was like, well, you know, yeah. And she said, well, Curtis, I give you permission to go home early, okay? Sometimes you just need permission from someone, right? And, and so I said, yep, Cindy, you're right. All right, I'm going to go home. And I went home, you know? You know, I just want to say, I just want to give you permission to, to be a person who laments. Right? And, and it's not me. We have permission, and it's been modeled even by Jesus to lament. We're, we're called to lament, to lament the ruptures in the world, ruptures in relationships, and it's prayer. And, and we just don't hear that much. I looked on Facebook just the other day. I saw, okay, you know, that's kind of like my newspaper, I guess. But um, a Christian leader in our country, within, I, I looked at it this morning. It's been shared 77, 988 times. This is what our, this leader said less than 48 hours later. This is how many times it's been shared. America is in trouble. At 62 years of age, I've lived long enough to learn that neither the Democrats nor the Republicans can turn this country around. No political party or politician is the answer. Amen? I think we could all agree. The only hope for this country is Almighty God and His Son, Jesus Christ. Next year, I am planning to travel to all 50 states to conduct, conduct prayer rallies. We are calling this the Decision America Tour. I want to challenge Christians to boldly live out their faith and to pray for our nation and its leaders. 
I want to encourage Christians to get out and vote and to cast their ballots for candidates who uphold biblical principles. I want to strongly urge Christians to run for public office at every level, local, state, and federal. We will not be endorsing any political candidates, but I'll be proclaiming the truth of God's gospel in every state. More details will come later. I hope you'll start praying with us now. We're accustomed to these kinds of prayers, you know? I, and I, yeah, man, I want to pray that, that God will turn this country around. But it always gets me a little concerned, especially as an indigenous person, when it seems like that if we, we pin maybe a little too much on the White House or on Congress or on the Senate, you know? Because if we're going to see this country turn around, I would have to believe that we, the church, God's people, living out, being people who are reconciled one to another, being people who, whose community reflects uh, what we like to say, the full mosaic of God's kingdom with all peoples, all nations, all people groups. And I don't know, I don't have too much faith in Washington, especially in light of the history of our country. When I was in college, I, I came across this history book called The Light and the Glory. The premise of it was, this was written in the maybe 60s, 70s, and you know we had a tumultuous time in our country then. Kind of like, now oh, maybe. But the, it, was, it was a historical perspective on, on challenging Christians that perhaps we need to go back to the original call God had given those who had discovered this country to, to be light to the world, a city on a hill, right? And, and to bring the good news of Jesus to, to the people of this land, the Indians. Or as the Declaration of Our Independence says, the merciless, savage Indians. See where I'm going? Our Declaration of Independence has that phrase, the merciless, savage Indians. Our Constitution, a plain reading of it, says, speaks of, um, it doesn't even include, acknowledge the full humanness of Native Americans and African Americans. And where does that come from? It comes from, in, in 1452, listen to what a, a pope wrote. And then a series of bulls, further bulls, were written. Invade, search out, capture, vanquish, and subdue all Saracens and pagans whatsoever, and other enemies of Christ, wheresoever placed, and the kingdoms, dukedoms, principalities, dominions, possessions, and all movable and immovable goods whatsoever held and possessed by them, and to reduce their persons to perpetual slavery, and to apply and appropriate to himself and his successors, the kingdoms, dukedoms, countries, principalities, dominions, possessions, and goods, and to convert them to his and their use and profit. That was written by a pope. That bull and others following led to what developed what was called the doctrine of discovery. The doctrine of discovery that, that helped to propagate, um, well, helped to for European explorers to really believe that what they're doing was something God ordained, whatever land you find that are not ruled by Christian rulers, those people, I'm quoting, those people are less than human and the lands are yours for the taking. Someone representing Jesus Christ wrote that about my people, my ancestors, right? Indigenous peoples, because they discovered us. And, you know, we've been homeland security since 1492. You can think of it like that. This is, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and say it, but you could say that, that our country was founded on, on, by terrorist activity, if you use the definition, definitions of today. That's very inflammatory, but it's something that, you know, when you look at the kinds of actions that were taken. And see, this is not just something, the doctrine of discovery is something that has helped to develop our legal system. 
uh, in 2007, the United Nations General Assembly voted on the Declaration of Indigenous Peoples, on the rights of Indigenous Peoples. The vote was 143 to 4 to pass it. The four countries that voted against this declaration, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, and the United States of America. Later on, they, they under with pressure from Indigenous Peoples, they changed their votes but like, where does that come from? It comes from an argument that has been made by, by writers, and, and I've been reading about this more, about, about this doctrine of discovery. It has even influenced our Supreme Court, which, which as recently as 2005, um, the Supreme Court drew upon a decision that was made in 1823 about a dispute of the purchase of land. There were two parties that purchased land, one from an Indian and one from um, a non-Indian. And what did the Supreme Court rule? Based on their using the, the doctrine of discovery, they argued that they, they gave, voted in favor of the person who poaches from a non-Indian person. They drew upon that doctrine of discovery. And that decision has been used in many cases. But they were referring to the papal bulls and the, this whole movement it was called Johnson versus McIntosh. Someone wrote that the, in, the impact of Johnson versus McIntosh is an Indian policy that, quote, rests on a foundation of racism, ethnocentrism, repression of tribal, inappropriate policy making by judicial bodies, and inaccurate historical understandings. It's, it's something that's present today. As recently as 2005, the Supreme Court drew upon that court decision, you know. I. I read these things and hear these things, and I feel anger. I feel anger because it's not something that's been taken care of or, or healed. In 1890, there's what is known as, it used to be called the battle at Wounded Knee. Now they call it the massacre at Wounded Knee. And a holy man from the Oglala Sioux, decades after this massacre, he, he said this, and so it was over. I did not know then how much was ended. When I look back now from this high hill of my old age, I can still see the butchered women and children lying heaped and scattered all along the crooked gulch as plain as when I saw them with eyes still young. And I see that something else died there in the bloody mud and was buried in the blizzard. A people's dream died there. It was a beautiful dream. Black Elk, a holy man of the Oglala Sioux. Decades after the United States Army slaughtered, or in his words, butchered between 150 and 350 women, children, and warriors. And you know what? 20 Congressional Medals of Honor were awarded to soldiers from that massacre soldiers who participated. Numerous efforts have been made to have these medals rescinded as this massacre can arguably be seen as a war crime, but every attempt has failed. I don't say this to say, man, look how bad our country has treated indigenous peoples, but I say it to, to share of, of a rupture that's present. There are people who, who, among indigenous peoples, native peoples, who just want nothing to do with the church. The church said, the bride of Christ. Why? Because of, of history like this, of a Christian nation that has come and, and dominated and conquered and, and th stories like this. I don't share it to say that, that um, you know, we need to fix it. I share it to say there is lamenting to be done. And the prayer that was called for America to be turned around, man, I'm gonna, I'll pray. I'll pray that the gospel of Jesus will be proclaimed and that lost people will be found. But just as much I would say there's the need for us to pray and lament. I haven't met him yet, but a man named Mark Charles, he's Navajo. Um, he was just in Chicago speaking, working with the CCDA. Um, he does work with the Reformed Church, Calvin College, and speaks all across the country. But he is proposing that in December of 2016, we have a truth commission 
where people can share, indigenous peoples can share the brokenness. And what is that? That's lament. That is lament. In December of 2014, he read at the, White, at the mall in Washington an official apology from the United States government to the native peoples of, of this land. It was buried in page something way deep in a 2010 defense appropriations bill or something like that. It was a quasi-apology, you know. Um, it was one of those apologies, I'm sorry, um, but, you know, kind of thing. But he read it publicly. He invited the author of the bill. He invited the president. He invited all kinds of leaders. Uh, no one responded. Um, CNN covered it. That was the only major news outlet that covered it. Um, but he shared this public reading. He has made a call for prayer that would be needed to turn this country around. And it's the prayer of lament. I don't know where it's going to go. I don't know if it's going to happen. But as a, as a fellow indigenous person and as a fellow brother in Jesus Christ who's been given like you and I the ministry of reconciliation, I can't help but to say, Mark, I'm with you. And I lament with you. These stories, this history, it's a dark part of our country's history that rarely gets discussed. Our country's, well, it's kind of apologized, you know, but it traces all the way back to papal bulls. Friends, we have been given the ministry of reconciliation, and I, I just have to say, it's a trail that needs to be covered with tears. But tears are not the end, because in Christ Jesus, we have hope. It's not something that we do to just embitter us and develop calloused hearts towards one another, but it's a part of healing. Reconciliation without lament cheapens hope, is what Kentongolian Rice said. The United States, in the era of this assimilation process, became known as the Great White Father. And we were seen as like wardens of the Great White Father of this country, indigenous. There is a scene of a movie, and I would encourage you to watch. It's called Smoke Signals. And it's a story. It's a story of a father and a son, a son whose father leaves him as a child and, and goes to Arizona. He was in Idaho, the Corlean Indian Reservation. And um, as he's an adult, he finds out his dad is, is, had died in Arizona. So he goes on this journey with a, with a partner. It it's, has great Indian humor in it, but... But he's, he, he goes on this journey, and along the journey, he recounts the pain in his life. And there's this powerful scene at the end of the movie. It's not Christian, but it's, it has a Christian message. He's standing on a bridge overlooking some rushing water. And, and as he's on it, he, he pours out the ashes of his dad, and they go into the river. And then he, he lays down the, pot, the, the container, and he, he lifts up his arms, and he just starts yelling, ah! And, and he's lamenting the pain of his life that happened from losing his father. And as he's lamenting, with his arms raised up and the cry from deep within his soul, this poem is read. I want to read it to you. And if you can imagine a lamenting young Native American man who's had pain from missing his father, these are the words. How do we forgive our fathers? Maybe in a dream. Do we forgive our fathers for leaving us too often or forever when we were little? Maybe for scar scaring us with unexpected rage or making us nervous because there never seemed to be any rage there at all. Do we forgive our fathers for marrying or not marrying our mothers? For divorcing or not divorcing our mothers? And shall we forgive them for their, their excesses of warmth or coldness? Shall we forgive them for pushing or leaning, for shutting doors, for speaking through walls, or never speaking, or never being silent? Do we forgive our fathers 
in our age or in theirs or in their deaths, saying it to them or not saying it, if we forgive our fathers, what is left? It's a powerful, powerful conclusion to this story. And what I want to say is, as an indigenous person who reads these stories, and I know people who feel the pain, I feel it. I think of that great white father idea. How do we forgive our great white father? It's in the ministry of reconciliation. It's in the gospel of Jesus Christ, who didn't just come so we can have an insurance policy, so we can get to heaven. He came so that his kingdom might be made known here on earth. And I have to believe that a part of that kingdom, that kingdom expression, would be people like you and I, who come from all kinds of different stories and different backgrounds, different ethnic groups, who have all, we all have stories of pain and brokenness. And how can we find hope? Through the power of the cross. The power of the cross. I have come, one of the anthems, hymns, in, our, in, our, in my community, in our people in Alaska, is in the sweet by and by. And as I've reflected on coming here, I've, I've realized, you know, that's, that in the sweet by and by speaks of a land fairer than day. And by faith we can see it afar, for the Father waits over the way to prepare for us a dwelling place there. And it's a song that people sing. We love to sing it. But I, I came to realize, you know, that's a lament because we, we've experienced pain and brokenness, alcoholism, suicide, the abuse of women, the, our assimilation of our culture, the loss of our culture. We've experienced pain. But the Father waits over the way to prepare us a dwelling place there in the sweet by and by. And so I'll just close with this song. It's in the sweet by and by. Um, we shall meet on that beautiful shore. It's the word ariga, which I shared with you on Tuesday. It's good. It's good. The gospel of Jesus is good. Ariga, matnavu, parisivut kvenam sinani. Ariga, matnavu, parisivut kvenam sinani. Be blessed. And I give you permission. Jesus gives us permission to enter into people's stories and to lament with them. God bless you as you do that.